Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Sensafili Sparring Partners webinar on Vendor Perspectives on Open RAN. Our speakers today are Aji Ed, Head of Cloud RAN at Nokia, Jeff Hollingworth, CMO at Rakuten Symphony, John Baker, SVP of Business Development at Mavenir, and Monica Paolini, Principal at Sensafili. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be moderating our webinar today. Inspiring Partners, we watch our debaters discuss a topic live on video. We'd like to encourage your audience to participate in the conversation. So please share your comments and questions using the Q&A and chat functions on the Zoom taskbar. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. And our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along and as they become relevant to the topics being discussed. So please feel free to ask questions at any point during the webinar. And with that, I will hand it over to Monica. Kendra, thanks so much for uh, the introduction. And as always, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, to talk again about Open RAN, uh, the last Faring Partners was also on Open RAN. It's uh, clearly a hot topic. And um, I decided to do another one um, because of the latest uh, announcements from the operators. But uh, what I wanted to do actually is to talk about the vendor. So the operators uh, have you know, made the decision, some of them, on <clears throat> how to go ahead with uh, uh, Open RAN. And so the question is, uh, what does that mean for the vendors? How is that, uh, you know, finally seeing that Open RAN is uh, uh, becoming more of a, you know, wider uh, uh, deployed choice, uh, how is that changing the way they operate? And so uh, here for, you know, all of you in the audience, uh, uh, you're familiar with Open RAN. So we're not going to start, we, we take for granted that we know what the basic tenets of uh, Open RAN is. And we're going to go and see what happens from uh, uh, how is it the vendors see it. And today I have been very lucky to have a, a good selection of vendors. Yeah, and Rapid and uh, Symphony um, to to talk about it and so to see how did what is the different approach to the market. So with that said, uh, probably most of you already know uh, the, the debaters today, but uh, what we'll do is that we'll go and I will ask them to introduce themselves and then we'll go with the description with the with the conversation. And uh, as Kendra said, uh, you know, feel free to uh, ask questions as we go along. There is no QA at the end. So uh, you know, and also you don't have to ask questions. You can just uh, say what you think and say your comments. Uh, uh, that there is no no issue. Just keep in mind that everybody sees it. With that in mind, uh, why don't we start with uh, John? How about you? You want to yeah. tell us? Sure. Good, Go ahead. Good, mo good, good morning, everybody. And uh, my name is John Baker. For those that don't know me, I'm SVP of Business Development for Mavenir. Um, I've been leading the Open Round Initiative for Mavenir now for seven years. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been a journey. So, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we're all heading in the right direction. So looking forward to the debate today and uh, and uh, looking both on the upside and the downside of, uh, you know, the opportunity. Yes, and John recently was uh, uh, testifying in Congress. So maybe we'll tell us more about that. Jack, what about you? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Jeff Hollingworth, uh, working for Rakuten Symphony. I I like the context John gave there, seven years to get to this point. So I think it'll be an interesting discussion to see how we can make the one year move a little bit faster. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Jeff, some of you will know he has been uh, on Sparing Partners earlier. And Arjun said he's a new guy. And uh, congratulations, because you just got uh, your new job right now. So congratulations and tell us what it is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. So uh, I'm Ajit. I'm head of Cloud Run. As you said, it's a new role for me and um, Cloud Run in Nokia. So I'm leading the Cloud Run solution ecosystem and uh, working with all the partners and creating the Cloud Run solutions together. So obviously, I'm very delighted to be part of this conversation today. And obviously, we need to talk about what's happening around the industry. So looking forward to it. 
Excellent. So, um, and I think this is going to be a good discussion today because uh, even though different vendors are obviously competing with each other, uh, you know, we also collectively know each other and, you know, after the discussions, we go and have a beer or whatever. So uh, it, it is actually, you know, people know and respect each other. And so it's going to be, a, 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 it's going to be a good and honest conversation. So, uh, Okay, let, let's get started with, with the reasons why I thought it would be a good idea to have this uh, sparing partners on the vendors. Um, so we saw, uh, you know, there was the announcement from AT&T, one and one and DT, Richard Telecom, uh, about, uh, you know, basically signaling that they're ready to deploy um, open RAN. Uh, however, one thing that has been remarked uh, by many is that their selection was for a limited number of vendors, and the initial idea of Open RAN is that you'd have a huge number of vendors, and you know, here and there. Um, and uh, I think that that's actually a very good way forward in the sense that you you want to sort of open up the RAN gradually. You don't, you know, especially if you are uh, a, a brownfield operator, you want to move carefully as you move forward, which doesn't mean that you're not committed. That means that you you want to keep control over how things go. But this is my view. I would like to have to hear what you guys uh, think about it. Who wants to go first? Or do I want me to? Jeff, how about you? <laughs> There no, you let, let me let me kick off then. I I think huh, I think the the industry is in a very I'll use the English word interesting place. I uh, the uh, and I think our uh, mobile network operator customers from all of for all of us are in a really quite difficult position. On one hand, uh, there is tremendous financial pressure. I mean, if you are almost a monopoly leading vendor for an industry, but you're announcing challenging financials and, and like layoffs. I think that's very indicative of an industry that is struggling and needs to change. And it's not an industry that hasn't got demand. It's an industry that isn't orchestrated the right way. But what we have to embrace, I think all of us on the supply side is counter to that is a tremendous risk uh, of uh, failure for these people. They lose their jobs. It is not a it's not a casual business in the slightest. Uh, so I think what we're seeing, and we should celebrate after seven years, as John says, that the whole industry doesn't question anymore moving in this direction. Everybody says it. But I think we have to respect and understand from the mobile network operator perspective that there are different models that balance different risk profiles with different skill sets, uh, with different uh, realities of deployment that they exist in. Uh, and none of them are wrong. It's choosing the right one for, for you as a business. And when I say you, the mobile network operator. If in, And I'll say the last comment and then we'll uh, hopefully pass it over. I think the mobile network operators have a huge responsibility to decide what happens with open run because at the end of the day it either becomes a tagline on status quo or it becomes something that materially changes economics and business performance uh because it's just a technology of interfaces uh and as we all know you can you can do whatever you want to do with technology no, absolutely. And I think it's it's really important to keep in mind. And, and I guess that, you know, in general, in wireless, we've seen, you know, the last uh, two, three decades, like uh, incredible growth. And uh, it, it's kind of when you think about it, maybe it's not really sustainable forever. So we need to sort of come to terms with the, this kind of constraints as well, which has nothing to do specifically with uh, open RAN. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with that last comment from Jeff. Uh, I think... Um... You, you, you know, what we've done as an industry now with Open RAN is put the power back to the procurement people. I think, you, you know, and I think to, to a certain extent, I don't think they've realized, they realize yet what power they have back in their hands in terms of vendor choice and negotiation of how to put this lot together. Um, you know, I, I, I always say, look, you know, unless you've got two vendors 
showing interoperability, then you haven't got open RAN. You know, single supplier solutions that have not been interoperated are not open RAN. And, uh, you know, that's just one supplier's interpretation of a specification. And and we've seen it, you know, we've done probably, what, 14 radio um, interoperability tests. We've, we've just recently done Nokia, and uh, we did that in four days. Um, but, you, you know, at the end of the day, it still comes down to who, you know, how do you interpret the bits and the bytes and the specs? So, you, you know, in the sense that, you, you know, if you've got a single supplier solution, it's a proprietary solution until, uh, you know, until it's been interoperated with another supplier's components. But, you, you know, coming back to the, the, the you know, the, the vendor choices that have been out there, you know, you've also got to take account of the point in time when decisions were made you know a lot has changed in the last two years in terms of you know O-Rain alliance, spec O-Rain alliance specifications interoperability testing and everything else so so you know you are going to see some 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 you know one-off supplier decisions are out there but you know dish you, you know and again you know that's the largest open RAN network in the world you know is with 20,000 sites of Two vendors that have shown two, two or more vendors, you know, that have shown interoperability. So it does work, but again, you know, I think you know they took they took the procurement side into their own hands and made sure that that vendors did comply to our specs and did do interoperability testing. And, and this is really what it comes back to. And and I think you know the biggest fear and you know that this that that I have, and this is one I've been you know very vocal about on LinkedIn is that. You know, through commercial pressure of a vendor on a on an operator, we don't let things slip backwards. That you know, operators accept proprietoriness because somebody says, "Oh, well, I can't develop it in time." You know, it's not a case anymore of well, you've got to wait for a large vendor to come along with a uh, you know a feature or functionality. You know, you've got choice out there now, and I think that's what the the procurement organisations have got to get their arms around is how to start to leverage choice. Um, you know, safely and you cho safely choose a, you know multiple vendors in 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 terms of the bits and pieces for their network going forward. Absolutely, Adi. What about what do you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with um what John said. Having a single vendor in an open RAN network is not necessarily open, right? <laughs> Obviously, we are talking about multiple vendors. That is what is required to make it really open. So. But I think before moving into the discussion, I think it is still important to clarify them some terminologies. Even though we talk about open time, everybody knows open time, but there's still a lot of confusion around what is open time. From our perspective, we talk about open time, which means it's all about the both horizontal and vertical disaggregation. It is not just one level of disaggregation, what it means. It's about open front hall, it's about near real time break, it's about edge apps, non real time break, R apps, and all of this horizontal disaggregation. At the same time, we talk about vertically, which means the virtualization of the baseband, which means we talk about multiple server platforms, different cast layers, different uh, automation tooling, and different RAN applications on top. So it's, it's a collective thing. That's where Nokia, we launched this AnyRAN last year as a part of a holistic solution what we brought in together. Now, just to, it is worth to reflect on the progress, like John said, on the progress what we made in the last couple of years. You know, ORAN Alliance, now comprising of more than 280 companies. But if you look at the contributions to the Oran Alliance standards, I'm happy to say, proud to say, Nokia is one of the leading vendors, the leading vendors in terms of contributions to the Oran Alliance standards, which is important because this that defines the specification to rate, uh, take things forward. And we have been co-chairing three of the working groups, the Open Front Hall, the Near Real Time Rig, ONM. So that's, again, setting the foundation for the future. And as John said, working with the additional multiple vendors and partners, it's important to do the interoperability. We are done with the five vendors, including Mavity, which we did it in you know uh, uh, super speed. Within four days, we are able to do the interoperability, which shows the kind of interfaces that we have aligned and or aligned specification. And... Exactly when you talk about operator space, we are talking about multiple operators. We are really working with working with them to really implement open RAN, like Deutsche Telekom, uh, Di like Docomo. So this open RAN trend is there, so it needs to continue, and that requires some changes in the mindset from operators and likewise. At the same time, vertical disaggregation is important as well. When we talk about multiple partners we work with, you know, AWS, Microsoft, Google, HP, Dell, IBM, and so on to create this joint solution together. So that's the, the motto, both end-to-end, -end, both horizontal and vertical disaggregation. This needs to come forward. 
Uh, absolutely, and I'm really glad you 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 brought it up in the issue of the multiple layers because, and this is why I started to talk about open rent with a small O rather than capital O because what is really fascinating about open rent is actually the you know the vertical disaggregation is not just the U and C U it's just opening the whole network, and and that that really makes it so much of a bigger enterprise. And in fact, if you see the Oran Alliance is also expanding, you know, over the year has been expanding its scope. And so when, you know, people look at, you know, how many CU and uh, the U vendors you have, I think that this is just more than, uh, uh, you know, it, it's actually the scope is so much bigger, which means that as a vendor, you also have to change. So it's not just having par partners, uh, <clears throat> you really have to work with them. Yeah. It's Absolutely. Way. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I just saw a question come in from Stefan Pongratz that I think is yeah. a really mm -hmm. good question uh, mm -hmm. that I'd just like to address. Where uh, is there a risk that we give operators too much power uh, and uh, it doesn't ensure a healthy supply chain? Mm -hmm. I, the, I, think, I think we have to, I, I, I'm, I'll go a little bit English here in the sense that sometimes we get caught up in the celebration of of open run and the success. It's not a religious war, it's an economic model. It's an economic business we have to resolve. John equates at the moment, I think you're up to about 300 different open run yeah. compliance suppliers. If we don't open up the market and the supply chain, there'll be five again. And telecom will never attract uh, another cluster of uh, ecosystem suppliers. I uh, The... So there is a this sense of being able to to actually put together solutions that make economic sense, control the risk, and sustain that innovation. Otherwise, this innovation will disappear, uh, and that's kind of the risk that we're playing on. So I'm not so sure. I'm worried about uh, operators uh, having too much uh, dominance and weakening the supply chain. Because I think we're at such a swing of the pendulum over to the other the other direction, where the danger at the moment is the open run actually is weakening the the traditional supply chain even more dramatically. Yeah, I could I could be a little, a little bit more adventurous in in sort of this discussion because I think I think to be honest, I think certain individuals have got it all wrong in terms of how they're thinking about the supply chain of what it really is. I think. You, you know, really, if you go back to what the beginnings of Open RAM was all about, you know, the vendor, you know, the operators really wanted choice. And if you go back five years, you know, you look through the press articles of Deutsche Telekom and others that, you know, they were frustrated with a two vendor supply chain. And, uh, um, and to that extent, that was really sort of part of what propelled Open RAM to, to where it is today. Now, you know, the other side of it is, I think, you know, we've, we've, we're living in an interesting week with, you know, the two, you know, both Nokia and Ericsson sort of publishing their financial results. But, you know, in some respects, I think the whole supply chain and ecosystem is is, is changing drastically. And I think, um, you know, those companies that are not preparing for a diversified supply chain, um, you know, are going to be in for, you know, some, some interesting times. And I think... Um, you, you know, what's going on here is that, you, you know, we've exposed all of the elements of the supply chain. Now, you know, it's not to say that a lot of the suppliers that now are in the open round supply chain weren't supplying the closed networks. They probably were, but, you, you know, we've exposed all of those suppliers and, you know, shifted the whole investment model for the RAN across a very large number of suppliers such that, you know, as a as a company, you don't have to develop everything yourselves now. You know, it's not a it's not a hardware model. And I think you know the fact that virtualization has really become a key part of the uh, the whole description of Open RAN. I think is 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 very important. But you know, you're living on the investment dollars of Intel, Dell, AMD, etc. You know, as a, as a you don't have to be a totally integrated you know company now to do this themselves. And and I think the other piece, you know, from a um, on the supply side, you know, that 
smaller companies are, are, are breaking up the, the 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 revenue market share in a sense that you know it's it's smaller companies you know it's it's can take smaller contracts at a different value level than you know what's necessarily acceptable today to the to the incumbents because um you know there's a whole different profitability model that exists on the smaller companies that does and on the larger companies so so i think i think we're right at the front end and you know and certainly we're seeing the cracks you know in this in, in this week with you know statements like well this is not acceptable and you know well it, it's maybe not acceptable to you but it's acceptable to a lot of smaller companies that can now play and i think that's what we've done is that, that we, we've we've generated some turbulence in the marketplace and you know i had a boss at one point in time and, led, and said to me look you know if you can never cut fast enough when these things start to happen in terms of getting you know restructuring organizations and i think i think you, unless people are planning forward then you know that's the situation they're going to be and they're always going to be looking backwards and looking forwards and i think the small companies you know, have a real opportunity, and I think you know it's reflected. I you know you know and I you know I I do have you know points of conflict, if you like, with the way the analysts are reporting the numbers. I don't I don't agree with some of the numbers that are out there, and I've you know because they're not being calculated correctly, and uh, um, you know, but uh, you know we'll see how that all develops. But but you know the open round is about the hundred and thirty odd vendors, etc., or three hundred vendors, and how that market share is split across those 300 vendors so you know there's a lot, lot in there to, to unpack but but i think you know we're right at the front end of the industry you know radically changing to become one of a, a, a multiple sources of supply in the industry yeah um i really want to say so yeah maybe, yeah maybe I, I will just talk about i think there was one more question on uh, on that channel. Yeah, actually, yeah. Let me let me read it because then uh, when people listen it online, they don't see the the chat. So <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, read it. Uh, and uh, 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 it's a question from Arno. It's uh, uh, about smaller companies might serve smaller opportunities, but are these economically viable? Vi viable? Uh, hundreds of RU suppliers are not expanding the market. They're just uh, they might just fragment it. And actually, this was something that I wanted to follow up on what John said. And it's, so I think that on one hand, it's true that with Open RAN, you have a wider choice of vendors. Uh, although I think that that's also, it's not just Open RAN, it's also virtualization that right. it's helping. So the two, the, the combination of the two is actually crucial, both to the success of Open RAN, but also to the disaggregation uh, part. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, uh, volumes still matter, and so operators are still going to. Uh, in you know, and we see in the um, uh, in in, uh, in the recent uh, announcements that you're still going for big suppliers. So I think that yes, it is true that the small suppliers are encouraged, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have everybody. So there is a risk of fragmentation. But I don't think that it's actually really happening because uh, uh, operators are still going to go for vendors that are, uh, so to say, reliable in terms of in terms of size. So, uh, I don't know, uh, Ajay, what, what is that you're saying? Yeah, maybe, maybe let, let me take this. Um, yeah. See, I think one of one of the things what we need to really remember is when we're talking about operators implementing Open Run or Cloud Run Network. We are, we are talking about current reality. That is, most of the networks are brownfield today. So that means they have a very highly performing uh, systems, which is built with purpose-built whatever is today, right? That's a reality. So when we bring Cloud Run or Open Run into those network, there are some important considerations that we need to make. Why I'm, com I'm coming to the number of vendors from that perspective, because important consideration, because we need to make sure of the end, the performance we need to make sure of the, the feature parity because unless until you are able to bring the list of features, set of features which are already available with the purpose built on the existing network, you cannot implement Cloud Run, Open Run effectively into the network because that that's like you are comparing a Formula One car with a regular sedan kind of features and user experience. That's a, that's a kind of a scenario we talk about, right? So this is a fundamental thing that defines, I agree with what John and Jeff said. I, I think this opens up opportunity for different players. As long as there is a certain 
ground level rules followed in terms of the openness, number one. Number two is the, the kind of a feature set richness, which we can bring it to the table. In terms of performance, we can bring it to the table. In terms of flexibility, we, we talk about flexibility because flexibility is the key all about. And the flexibility is spanning across end-to-end -end value chain. It's also about the silicon architectures that you should be able, you should not get locked with the one silicon architecture. You should be having multiple options, whether be it at status, it's be it ARM, be it uh, different cast layers, be it any radio vendors and, and so on. So this flexibility is important. And that's where I come back to uh, what we can also, we are planning to do, or we are doing it already last year, since last year, in terms of the any run, that we bring the flexibility, bring the future parity from day one. And that's the only way I see it. Even if you consider the smaller players, that yes, there's an opportunity, but they need to be effective in terms of bringing the feature set, bringing the performance to the same level to introduce this cloud run into the network or open run into the network. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just looking at the uh, at the other questions, but before we go to the questions from the audience, uh, I wanted to sort of follow up on what you said in terms of uh, you know chipset uh, choice. Because I think that the, the, there is a sense in which you try, you, you, we focus on opening the CU and DU and front hall interface and all that, which is very good. But then uh, the risk is that we might create a bottleneck some other places where you might have a more limited choice at the chipset level. And I think that what we're seeing right now, which I think is very interesting, is that that is also starting to to break in the sense that we're seeing more uh, openness there as well. Yeah. And it's not the front hall interface, you know, it's just way beyond that. And uh, how important do you think that is? And how, you know, uh, as, a, as, as a vendor, how, how do you work with that, with that part? I, I think, I think certainly from a Mavenir perspective, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, keeping an eye on, you know, other companies' developments and other companies' programs. You know, we've, we've been very open about, you know, the implementation, you know, whether it be Intel, NVIDIA, um, you, you know, the, 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 there are solutions coming along and, you know, and, and they will be a fit commercially and technically uh, for some of this. Now, you know, you've got to stand back again and realize, you know, the, and, and part of my testimony in Congress last week was sort of, you know, Open RAN has actually been a huge success. You know, three years ago, four years ago, actually, you know, Rakuten and ourselves couldn't go sell to a different operator and you know we were to completely locked out and to that extent now you know you've got you've got seven other system end-to-end -end system providers that are out there supplying you know potential systems into to mobile operators now you know the other side of it is and i think you know this is where some some caution and in, in terms of expectations needs to be really really there that you know, Open RAN is not a revolution. Is you know, operators have built networks, invested money. You know, they're vendor locked on contracts and stuff like that. And and it's going to take time for this to tr tr truly evolve. Um, and you know, and then a comment on this whole feature set. I think you know, there's been two independent uh, drive tests done by you know Signals Research, Michael Zelander's group. The compares you know both you know Mavenir and Samsung against you know, uh, you know, other competitors' networks and, and, and they're, you know, in some respects, they're equal and better in, in, in terms of performance. So, you know, this whole feature set performance issue, you know, is really sort of becoming a non-issue, you know, that um, the smaller suppliers can supply this stuff. And I, I've sort of put ourselves in that smaller supplier bracket, you know, that, that you can deliver this stuff. And it really comes down to, you um, you know, the procurement organizations, if you like, now getting on board and realizing what they can do both commercially and technically. Um, and I think that's 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 where the next year is going to be. It's, it's really about the commercial aspects of Open RAN, not, you know, none of this technical feature stuff anymore. It's, uh, you know, what can you deliver on time and can you meet the profitability expectations of what the operators are really looking for? Maybe, maybe I can I can add... Um... A couple of words to it. I think, yeah, I think uh, uh, it's important, of course, commercially. I mean, this is the uh, commercial aspects are driving the most of the discussions from an operator standpoint. Um, but uh, it, it, let's keep in mind that, you know, uh, as I said, so uh, the introduction is critical from a cloud run, open run perspective, because uh, we need to offer the same performance. So I'm not um, debating on 
it is important, but at the same time, it is, uh, at least from an introduction and um, sustainability perspective, it is it is critical. That is, um, that we have the similar performance from that perspective. So, um, but when it comes to the silicon architecture, uh, the split, what you mentioned, uh, it is, yes, it, it is it is providing different options to the, our customers, like whether it is energy efficiency, because it's all about energy efficiency is one of the prime drivers right now. So multiple silicon architecture, they can provide different options, be it uh, energy efficiency, be it uh, capacity, be it performance. So it's all about flexibility and options that we can give it to the customers. So. Yeah, I, th I think I'd like to come back to something that uh, we seem to forget uh, and uh, and John brought it up. Open RAN was started by the mobile network operators. It wasn't a vendor-led initiative uh, because they wanted choice and they wanted a different economic supply chain. Uh, and somehow we've ended up in an industry where it feels like the vendors who believe them are pushing a story to fix that problem. And I think we have to embrace the fact that there's a huge responsibility on the, the network operator side to, to then want to buy a different way because that's what they started the initiative for. At the same time, there's real challenges and obstacles in doing that because the, the center of responsibility for supply moves uh, so it's not only a procurement issue, issue, it's actually a, it is a, and it's not a technology issue, it's it's a delivery performance scale issue into, uh, into the actual networks, because no one else can afford that. And if you get that wrong, then it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there is, there's a, I think one, one discussion that we should be having, which is a challenge, if you've noticed, Rakuten didn't have a problem with this because we we put things together in software. We that's who we are. That's what we do. Dish has had a similar culture. That's not the the competence or the working model that exists in in most brand fields that we see. They usually outsource that, and they're not buying technology. They're buying insurance for successful rollout and delivery. That has to cope with the past as well. So. I'd, I'd like to keep the conversation that somehow we need to move the industry really quickly, but it has to be realistic and we have to, we have to appreciate the challenges in making that change. Which I think is the reason why uh, I personally think that you don't want to see the brownfields to move too quickly because the change is so deep and it's not just a technology change, it's a cultural change. It's the change in, way, in the way they operate. And that's, even though the technology is there to do it overnight, uh, it, it's just going to, I think it's going to take a little bit longer because even though it is driven by the operators and the operators want to change, change is hard for everybody. No yeah, but the, the winners, the winners will be the ones that move as quickly as possible without failing. Yeah. So it's walking that tightrope. Now we're in industry that is risk adverse. So that tightrope ends up being not a tightrope. It ends up being a four lane highway that we're not getting off. So how do you start to challenge the status quo in an operational model on the, on the customer side uh, to force the vendors to actually be realistic about fitting into that? And there are examples of this starting, uh, but we're seven years in. If we go yeah. back seven years and look at the state of technology elsewhere, I mean, maybe we're starting to do cloud as an industry. We're 15 years in on that one. Yep. So, so Jeff, you, you think that the operators are not moving quickly enough. And, you know, I, I think that I sympathize with that, but I can also see the other argument that, you know, virtualization took forever. Other industries are not as fast either. So uh, what about, Aji, what do you think? Do you think mobile operators are moving fast enough in your view? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with uh, Jeff and uh, John on that. I think uh, the the speed is not enough, in my view, and uh, there might be there are multiple reasons we can think of why it is so. But uh, at the same time, I think it it calls for a fundamental change in the mindset, as you mentioned. You know, we need to really look at what is required. I think there are multiple. I mean, 
challenges that we need to address. I think that we need to address um, in the realistic way. One of the things is the mindset change in the organization itself, because we're talking about forget all the automation, uh, AI, and uh, work, the use cases coming onto the edge, et cetera, which are more TCO driven, you know, what we can do as a part of the, while we're implementing Cloud Run. But it also calls for some fundamental change in terms of upskilling the resources, upskilling the workforce. Because we talk about a kind of integration of, you know, when we talk about open run and cloud run, integration of the cloud native principles with the run network. And that requires some change in terms of competence build up, expertise build up within the organization. Not only I'm just not talking about operators, but also from the vendor landscape. We need to really build this competence and this is what we need to prepare for. One key question would be, how do I train my uh, people? Whether should I train the run engineers to IT skilled, or should I train my IT skilled engineers, cloud engineers to the run? There is no single answer to that question. So it is like um, the truth lies in between. So we may have to do both. You know, we may have to retrain our uh, workforce to do both. I'm, I'm saying we means vendor, operator alike, because why it is so? Because uh, that is answering to the question of uh, integration topic. What is one of the questions came there? You know, system integration is a topic there that leads to these questions like who will own the integration? Because if it is operators owning it, because there are some cases we are seeing operators like tier one operator, like Docomo, they are planning to do it. Uh, and I think Rakuten did that the same before. So uh, planning to do the integration by themselves, which means they have to build up the competency. They need to have an R&D level expertise. It's not necessarily always possible with all our operator organization. So then it leads to other approaches on the system integration, whether it is a uh, vendor driven, it could be like a baseband provider, like any of the vendors, like uh, Nokia, Mavenir, uh, any of them, like could be the, the system integrator, which again, that organization needs to build up the expertise because why baseband provider? Because baseband is the integral part of this whole solution and you need to ensure the SLA and performance. So it calls for a change in the, uh, upskilling the resources workforce because of the multiple challenges, the integration and alike. Absolutely. And I think it's a, it's crucial to keep in mind that uh, whatever solution is going to be the same for everybody. And that's the beauty. I mean, that, that that's the whole point, right? To have the flexibility so that you, you find this as, a, as an operator and I guess as a vendor too, you find the solution that works better for you, which not, might not be the same for another. So let's go back to the to some of the questions from the audience and we have two that are related to the, the sort of system integration and the, the management so Yvonne uh, asks about don't you think that the responsibility of integrating a multi-vendor network is something that operators try to avoid uh, for instance because of this cost of skills for building a test lab um, and uh, uh, is that an obstacle to the adoption of a truly open RAN? So that's the that's the question is that how, how much do they want to take? And that sort of is tied with the um, system integration part. And uh, Timothy has a question about who will lead the integration and manage the life cycle of software and hardware. Not all operators have the resources to manage this complexity. And also I would say not only the resources, but they might not want to do it. Uh, you know, is, is it worth it for them to do it? Because traditionally, it would be the main uh, RAN vendor that would do effectively the system integration uh, or most of it. And now they have the option of doing it themselves, which I think it's a very interesting idea because uh, what that means, you know, the, the value of a network is how you operate it. it. It's not just a detail. It's really where you differentiate from uh, from the other operators. So is it, so it's something that you probably want to have more control on. And that's what Open RAN explicitly uh, not only allows you, but you, you kind of have to do it, you know, because you have to put all, all the pieces together. And I think that, that, that it's highly empowering for, for operators and enables them to differentiate from each other. Um, so how, how do you how do you see that? And I got into trouble be, uh, at some point a few years ago because I said, you know, uh, one potential issue is that if an operator doesn't do system integrate or integration, doesn't have uh, um, the vendor doing it, 
uh, but they go to a system integrator, that system integrator might become the gatekeeper in the sense that the system integrator only works with some vendors and therefore that limits the choice. So the flexibility that an operator would want to have with Open RAN, it's basically gone because of the selection of a system integrator. Do you see that as a, as a potential issue or how do you view the whole system integration bit? Yeah, I think, I think I think one of the things in you know we're trying to force fit a change in the ecosystem into existing models that have been around for 10, 20 years. You, you know, I've built multiple networks around the world, and in the end, you, you know, that you can still buy a whole system from a single vendor, but the operator still takes like you know project management, ownership of some of this stuff in terms of the civil works and and stuff like that. So, so in reality, I don't. I think there's little change that's going to happen with a lot of the operators, you know. And and I think you know what what softwareization has done to mobile networks going forward is it's changed the way in which integration is actually happening. You know that, you know, we were putting in Dish like a thousand sites a day coming on air because. You know, at the end of the day, you know, your hardware installers were putting the equipment out there. Once it was connected and power, everything was being done with, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, through software. And previously that that may have been done with technicians going to sites and stuff like that. So 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 the model of building a network is now changing. Um, and, and then, you know, from a, a, a system integration perspective, you know, if you look back at the, the early days of Wi-Fi, when Wi-Fi came, I think I, I think I bought my first Wi-Fi NIC card in, in 2001, I think it was, when the first ones were really coming out there. And you look at the, the challenges that were going on with integrating, you know, standalone Wi-Fi networks to the internet, you know, I think... I think all those issues are slowly sort of echoing through again in the open round ecosystem. And at the end of the day, you know, we'll, we will get to a plug and play scenario. I, I, I've sort of got great confidence that the industry will get to a plug and play and system integration will, you know, be, a, be, be greatly eased. And, and, you know, so I think, I think it's important to look at the, the discontinuities that are now appearing in the marketplace. Look, operators, operators are not profitable. You know, system integration needs to be done in a highly efficient way. You know, who takes over the vendor choice? You know, there's there's a multiple multiple things out there that are all you know all presenting change in the marketplace. And I think you know the longer we keep saying, oh well, you know, we're trying to force fit this into an existing model, then you know you know we're just you know, putting unnecessary hurdles in front of us. And I think, um, you, you know, we are seeing operators now, you know, why why have operators cut back on the spending? You know, 5G standalone has, is, has been a disappointment, if you like, in, in terms of the industry. Now, actually, 5G standalone, in, in going to 5G standalone is a great opportunity to change vendors, you, you know, because you can build a, you know, build a complete 5G standalone overlay network. And so, so there's a number of discontinuities out there that, you know, operators, I think, you know, and I'm putting my crystal ball out there, but uh, I'd like to hear comments. But I, I think operators are actually sitting back and thinking about what do they want to do next. And I think that's probably why we're seeing this lack of spending going on um, with mobile operators in the industry. Just thinking what's 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 ahead. Um, yeah. I I hope I uh, I hope that's true. Uh, the uh, I think I. Uh, the example that John just gave of actually the upside of uh, from a business point of view of implementing these technologies actually turns up in the operational efficiency and speed. So yeah. Rakuten did this for exactly the same reasons. Uh, it's one system design that operates across all of the infrastructure and is highly automated. So we were doing similar, you yeah. know, 600, 800,000 at the peak rollouts. Uh, the... I uh, and I don't think so. I think the the other insight is that not all operators have the same uh, desires, the same kind of opportunities. So the big operators can maybe uh, uh, invest in much different ways than smaller operators that uh, that need to consider what they're doing. But one shift that I would recommend that all the whole industry considers is it is a move of of ownership in system design from the supply side 
uh, to the uh, operator side. Uh, and it's an opportunity then to design something that actually is much more efficient and much more independent of, of uh, vendors. Uh, and as long as you understand and own that system design, then you can choose to outsource that to yeah. who you would like to do. But you have to hold that outsourcing accountable. You can't let that outsourcing then control your choices in the future. Uh, uh, and I think that's healthy. I think that's how businesses, uh, uh, successful businesses, take responsibility to to do something, uh, you know, uh, to control their own destiny. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe let me add a couple of words there. I think, uh, yes, I agree. I think um, it's all about who takes the accountability at the end. And operators would be in a best position to take the accountability because or responsibility at the end uh, because they have the full picture about the end-to-end -end subsystems, what vendors, and what kind of solutions are brought in. But of course, practically speaking, obviously, the truth lies somewhere in between. Meaning some of the operators, I agree, some of the operators, leading players, tier one operators, they have the capability to do this system integration by themselves. But not always, not many of them are, or maybe even in the tier one operators, for example, one of them, European operators, head of Open Run, told us directly, their option is somewhere in between. Meaning option one and two, what I mentioned before, that is like um, uh, the operators owning the system integration and a subsystem provider like a baseband provider is owning the system integration but somewhere in between that is they're able to do like bulk uh, some of the responsibilities from the system integration perspective and some of it is given to the baseband provider as a kind of a uh, splitting the responsibility between these players so this kind of approach is also possible but ideally yes it has to move into the direction where there is a full accountability lies with somebody who can drive this forward Absolutely. And, and I guess, you know, the, the issue about accountability and with, with disaggregation, you can disaggregate in whichever way you see fit. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's going back to what John was saying before, that uh, uh, we should just really try to move out of the, 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 the way we usually think about it. Mm -hmm. and, and everything is possible to some extent. Things that have not been tried before, some will work, some will not. And, uh, you know, the fact that we have the operators have the opportunity to try in of itself, it's a it's a great thing, and it's sort of like it, it's a, it's a like really moving to a more mature state. Now let's go to some of the other questions. There is a question here from Alexander. He asks, uh, should a large operator aim to have a common unified architecture across its network or radio sites uh, using the same suppliers and system the system, or should they encourage supplier diversity across its network? Now. Let me just first one say one thing is that all the mobile networks have been multiple vendors already, except that they would be just a, you know each city would be a different vendor. But it's not like multi-vendor is anything you know broadly new, radically new. It's the way the multi-network, the multi-vendors, the, the multiple vendors are working with each other that is different. <clears throat> but so, but maybe you can you can uh, address the question of how, how do you see that changing? It, you know. Uh, and and from from a vendor perspective, how is that you propose to the operator? Because even you might have different solutions, different architectures for different environments. How how do you see how do you see that? Who wants to yeah, let, let me let me because this is something very close to the heart. The <laughs> uh, the driving force here, at least from our design perspective, is not. Uh, uh, being limited by single supplier equipment. Uh, what you do want is to have a single operational model that scales. The one thing that ourselves and DISH have proven is that we've, we've rolled out and accelerated, and this technology works. I saw the recent analyst report, I can't remember the gentleman's name about DISH, where the network's great. Uh, in actual fact, now it's a, it's a question of actually uh, putting... Uh, uh, increasing the subscriber base. And that's yeah. exactly where Rakuten Mobile is in Japan. And also both companies have tremendously small workforces running that network because it's all highly optimized 
automated. Uh, so, and then the last thing is that we do have a bigger problem in the industry is, is that we've got to attach to new revenues uh, to actually supply any of this. Uh, 80% of, of network traffic uh, is indoor and nomadic, not macro. Uh, now that indoor coverage and nomadic coverage uh, is much more like the PC market where you get specialized vendors going into certain situations for certain scenarios. Uh, you want to be able to manage every single coverage area in the same way and embrace those different niche suppliers uh, to have choice. And that's at the end of the day, that's what we've done in Rakuten and we feel pretty good about that because it's working. And as the speed of integration of, of val validation of the radio units goes down, it just reinforces the model. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think I think you know adding to that, I think the the airport, and I think there's a question in there that the about certification, and I think you know this is the one challenge area that that really is still got to be resolved is about a common certification label for all around implementations, and I think that is going to be the essence of you know allowing different network architectures because operators want to know that you know what they're buying performs to a specification and you know and as i've said publicly you know that every vendor should implement the minimum defined requirements from the ORAN alliance and those minimum you know defined requirements are basically what gets certified and so you know because this then takes away the need for labs and um the need to go test everybody's product you know that can be done like we do for for radios today under you know etsy you know you take them to an independent lab they get independently verified and you know this should happen with the ORAN product and to that extent, there's I think there's 18 labs out there today that are you know capable of support you know doing certification, or you know attempting to do certification, and I think that will then clean up a lot of the ecosystem so that these re really become building blocks. And I say I you know we've got you know if you look backwards, you can take the analogy of you, you know cable internet and Wi-Fi access points. You know we went through the pain of all of that, and and, and the industry cleaned that up. And I think you know, the mobile industry is in catch up mode, if you like, in the sense of, you know, just getting into all of those issues. But I, I think the great thing is that there's a lot of opportunity out there for everybody. And, you know, uh, everybody's sort of worried about job losses, but I got to be honest, you know, they're maybe moving from vendor jobs to operator jobs. And, 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 you know, there's plenty of work out there for everybody and plenty, plenty to learn. So I think, you know, it's got, I think the industry has got a bright future. I think, you know, we just must stop thinking about it as the past and, look forward to what needs to get done to make operators profitable. Cause that's, that's really, you know, without an operator business model that's profitable, you don't have anything anyway. Um, you know, we're all chasing rabbits. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I think it's all about operators, uh, the financials and how we can make it profitable. I think uh, just to, just want to highlight that, you know, yeah, this is precisely, we talk about part, uh, the different options and we want to give as many options as possible to operator customers. Uh, whether it's enterprise or operators, we want to give as many options. And that's where we believe a strong partnership ecosystem is important. We believe in the power. For example, we, we I talked about you know uh, interoperability with the multiple vendors in terms of radio and baseband together. And at the same time, we work with the multiple industry partners to create the joint solution. For example, IWS, Microsoft, Google. So we bring it together. So it I, we strongly believe in this power because at the end of the day, we need to give all these different options. Why different options? Different reasons energy efficiency, capacity, whatever reason, if you talk about it. So it's all about giving the options with the partnership and we strongly uh, advocate that using our INIRAN and the partnership model that we're building. Yeah, so uh, we have a lot of questions and we're not going to be able to go through all of them, but I want to sort of start to combine a, a couple of them and uh, go back to what John said at the beginning about uh, the market forecasts. And so the question is about the future and the uh, uh, you know, the future of open RAN and the uh, uh, implementation. So uh, one question is about, uh, you know, uh, do we, should we expect uh, industrial scale deployment in 2024-25 or not? And uh, my, so this is a question, but my, my secondary question on top of that is, uh, how do we count that? Which is what uh, John was said at the beginning that he, you know, the, 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 the forecasts from the analyst, uh, uh, he doesn't agree with, with some of them. 
and I'm an analyst, but I don't know what market forecasts are, so I don't I don't take I don't have to take it personally. But 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 I do see exactly the point because um as open brand becomes more of a wider concept, does it even make sense to forecast open brand as a separate thing? Because it's really hard if you deploy something that uh, it's fully complies with the specifications, but you can deploy it in an open in a single vendor uh, proprietary manner, or you can deploy something that is upgradable to open RAN. So you don't deploy those open RAN today, but you move it to open RAN in a year, what does it count? So from a market forecast and deployment, just counting the you know, the deployments out there, it, it doesn't even make sense if we are just moving in that direction. So the question to you is that, when are we going to see the industrial scale deployments, and how, how do we count them? How how do we define something in the, as industrial scale or not, or open run or not? Is it is it really a, a clear cut line? So, John, why don't you take that first since you started it? Yeah, you, you know, I, I, I'll I'll, I'll put, try and put some color on this market analysis piece because I think you, you know what what you've got is you know it's like one hundred and thirty suppliers, and they're all you know, putting their piece in there. And I think, you know, you've got a lot of cross technologies that have not been reported before. So, you know, as an example, and this is not, uh, um, you know, you can take a computing platform from a Dell or an HP and, and they'll report their sales through other market means. Now, you know, in reality, that's a part of an ORAN system, right? And it's a part of an ORAN system sale. And yet, you, you know, you know, you can't just take the software piece of, of ORAN and say that's the ORAN market. I think, I think to be honest, that, that a lot of the figures that are out there today are optimistic on the close ran and pessimistic on the open ran side, which are completely upside down, um, because components and you know of these systems are not being reported correctly. Um, and to that extent, I think you know the analysts have got to find a way to bring bring in the total ecosystem. I think you know some some analysts, you know, and I'm, I'm probably going to you know, these guys know who I'm talking about as well. So um, you, you know that that the, the, they really need to come to a better way of of collecting this information to to present to the industry. But but you're right. You, you know, at the end of the day, you, you know, how do you value um, a piece of software that goes in Amazon Cloud? as part of the open rent system where previously that had been done, you know, with customized hardware, right? So, so the complete value of the ecosystem is changing the, you know, the, 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 there's no direct comparison. And that's why I come back to the initial point that smaller companies will survive and be very profitable in, in these uh, architectures and, and, and different solutions because they can concentrate on their technology that they're good at. Software providers like like ourselves, you know, we just concentrate on software. We'll make software happen, and Dell will, Dell and HP will constantly focus on making servers happen, right? Previously, that was all done by one company. No longer. So, so the models have got to change. The ecosystem is changing, and the profitability is changing. Um, so, you know, that's my two penny worth, and I'm happy to have a whole another debate on all of that because I could spend the next two hours on it. Yeah, I, I think that that would actually be worth spending a lot of time to just sort of think about how we count, how we measure things. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, are there any any comments on that? I don't think it's an interesting metric whatsoever. It's irrelevant. I think the interesting metric is is opex going down, is uh is time to market decreasing, and is competitiveness on the top line going up, and I. Uh, what we have seen is that the people that adopt these new technologies, of which Open Run is one, cloud, virtual, the disaggregation that uh, Aji was mentioning, uh, you get tremendously different uh, business results. Uh, so, uh, the world leading Open Run vendor apparently has deployed over a million base stations that are Open Run compliant already because the standard changed. Uh, it's uh, so I, I don't. I think we're chasing. A false ghost with those market share because I, yeah, it, I I tend to agree. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you know, you know, the travel the travel is the stock market, and you, you know, investors sort of look at the the, the total revenue numbers, and they they got to be looked at in a different way. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and I think that you know by you know by by doing this, you define uh, open run so in a such a narrow way. Uh, that that it's kind of becomes impossible for yeah. anybody to. It's it just like it creates a circle which is just not very healthy for anybody involved exactly. because you try, you know the whole point of open run is flexibility and then you sort of create 
uh, a way to classify it is completely non-flexible. Yeah. And so where are we going? You know, we're kind of, it seems like a, a little bit of self-defeating. Yeah, we're still trying to fit square pegs in round holes and uh, that, that ain't going to work much longer. Yeah. Yeah, coming back to the same point before, that a vendor or network with a single vendor is not necessarily open line, you know. <laughs> so it is, uh, we can, of course, claim it, but uh, there's not necessarily open line because it doesn't show the flexibility at all. Yeah, so I think uh, commercial implementation, uh, you are right. I mean, I think it depends on all, all these factors and we definitely see good momentum with the uh, customers and uh, that uh, we just published one case study with a uh, Evan Bulgaria customer today, uh, just today morning. So that is really talking about uh, what are these benefits of moving to Cloud Run in terms of um, uh, how we can exactly kind of uh, deploy this in a environment where we have a brownfield and uh, green the Cloud Run coming into picture together, how we can manage this customer experiences and so on. So it is, there are a lot of uh, interesting case studies coming up from customers and we will see good momentum this year in terms of Cloud Run and Open Run implementation. And that takes us at the top of the hour, and we need to give it back to uh, to Kendra, but uh, Adi, John, and Jeff, uh, thank you so much for participating, and all of you in the audience, uh, uh, sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, uh, uh, but they were all great questions. So thank you guys, and uh, Kendra, uh, back to you. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. That will conclude our webinar for today. Thanks again to our speakers for that great conversation and to our audience members for those wonderful questions. Uh, a recorded version of our webinar will be available at senseofhealy.com in the coming days, so check back there. And we have another Sparring Partners coming up February 13th, and registration for that event will be available at senseofhealy.com also. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.